This is the second video revising concepts for the block test for grade 11s and we're going to carry on now with the 2019 block test answering a few questions from there and the next question that we'll be looking at is 2.1.4. Now in this question we're given x minus x to the power of a half equals 6. Immediately alarm bells may be going off in your head and you're thinking to yourself how do I answer a question like this? because I haven't been prepped with how to deal with things that are not quadratic equations. Well, the truth is this question can be treated as a quadratic. And if it's treated like a quadratic, we can do the following method. So, step number one, make sure your equation is in standard form. So I would suggest moving everything over so that we have zero on one side of the equation. So x minus x to the power of a half minus 6 equals zero. Now for those of you who know the trick already, you'll know that I need to look at the power over here. If that power is half of whatever the power is over here, I can use a method called k substitution. I'm allowed to do that. Now in this case you'll clearly see that I have an exponent of a half there and so the experiment that you can go and try is go a half times 2 which is 1. So this number over here should be the exponent on our first term which it is. It's x to the power of 1. So I can actually rewrite this using a k substitution. So whenever we're choosing k in the beginning, I take my middle term, or that half term almost, and I would say let x to the power of a half equal k. Now if you're not sure what I'm doing in this particular example, please go and speak to your teacher about it as soon as possible, because you would have done examples like this in class. And so I am skipping a few steps as I answer this. But the idea is that you can see so far is that if I then said k squared, so in other words, k squared would be x to the power of a half all squared, which would just be x to the power of 1. So do you see now that I basically have a squared term, a single term, and a constant term? And whenever I have a squared term, a single term, and a constant term, you're thinking ax squared plus bx plus c. Squared term, single term, constant term. So I go and I substitute k in everywhere I see it. So we know that x is k squared. So it will become k squared minus x to the half is just k minus 6 equals 0. Now that's basically a quadratic equation. We're just using k instead of x. And so I can factorize it, I can complete the square, or I can use the quadratic formula. If I decide to use the quadratic formula, just make sure that you keep it in the form k equals. So in other words, k equals minus b plus or minus all the parts of the quadratic formula. In this case though, I am simply going to factorize it. So in this case, it can be factorized as x or k minus 3, k plus 2. Again, take a moment to see how I factorized it. And so I end up with k is equal to 3 or k is equal to negative 2. Then I'm going to substitute what I started with, which was the fact that x to the power of a half equals k. So I need to substitute x to the power of a half wherever I see k. And so I will get x to the power of a half equals 3 or x to the power of a half equals minus 2. And you should know from our rules of rational exponents that anything to the power of a half is basically a square root. So this is like the square root of x equals 3 or the square root of x equals negative 2. And so in order to deal with this, you should know that I square both sides. 
to get rid of that square root. So when I square both sides, I get x is equal to 9 or x is equal to 4. But going back to an example that we looked at in a previous video, where we had a square root and we had to check our answer. Whenever you have something like this, where we've got rational exponents, do yourself a favor and at the end of the question, just go and check your answer, okay? Because often you're going to end up with an answer that's not, in, that's not applicable, an answer that's invalid. And in this case, if I substitute x is equal to 9 into the equation, I get 6. But if I substitute x is equal to 4, my two sides don't balance. The left-hand side will not equal the right-hand side. And so this answer here is not applicable. So I hope you guys understood how I approached this question as a k-substitution. Just bear this in mind because they can get quite tricky. But if you're with me up until this point, they do become quite easy to solve. Let's have a look at another example now. The next question we're looking at is question 2.2. Now, the words completing the square might strike fear into many of your hearts, but don't worry. You've got the steps written out in your notes. If you simply follow them, you can't get these questions wrong. So whenever you see something completing the square, you know that this is actually an easy six marks. So step number one in completing the square was always to get the coefficient of x squared to be 1. So we're dealing with an equation, not an expression. So when I deal with an equation, I know I can actually just divide everything through by whatever the coefficient of x squared is. So in this case, p. And so I will end up with x squared minus 6 over px is equal to q over p. The next step was to take the constant term over. But do you see in this question that the constant term is already on the right hand side? So I don't even have to do that. It's done for me. Then I would go ahead and look at whatever the b term was. So in this case the b term is minus 6 over p. So you go to the side of your page and you write negative 6 over p divided by 2, which would be negative 6 over 2p, and then I square it. And I'm going to get 36 over 4p. And 36 over 4 is just 9, so it would be 9 over p. I then take that answer that I got, and I add it to both sides of my equation. So in other words, I would add it to the left hand side. So 9 over p. Don't forget the squared. So it's 4p squared, 9p squared. So it would be 9 over p squared is equal to q over p plus 9 over p squared. Let's just make that red as well. Over 9 over p squared. So, then I factorize my left-hand side, and the trick to factorizing it was simply to take what's ever inside the bracket. So, do you see inside the bracket we've got minus 3 over p? So, I write my two brackets out like that, it's squared x, and you simply take whatever that was over there, straight into your bracket. And that's going to then equal... The right hand side. The right hand side we want to find a common denominator which in this case would be p squared. So I'm going to write it as qp plus 9 all over p squared. Then in order to combat this root or that square over there rather, I take the square root of both sides. But when I take a square root, I don't forget my plus or minus. So we'd end up with x minus 3 over p is equal to plus or minus the square root of qp plus 9. So the square root of qp plus 9. And remember, 
if I take the square root of p squared, I'm just left with p. Do you see how the denominators always end up matching up? And so our final answer would be x is equal to 3 plus or minus the square root of qp plus 9 all over p. And we've gone and completed the square using variables. Might look like a difficult question, but you follow those steps and you get a free six marks. The final question that we're going to look at from the 2019 block test is on geometry. And more specifically, we are dealing with the line from center theorem. So line from center. From what you did in class, you will know that we have the theorem and its converse. So the reasons that you have to use are firstly, line from center, perpendicular to chord. And when the line from center is perpendicular to the chord, it bisects the chord. It cuts it in half perfectly. And then the converse of that is line from center bisects chord. You can write bisects chord as line from center to midpoint of chord. Either one of those two reasons is acceptable. Now, the way to sort of tell these apart is what is in the reason is what you're given. So in other words, if I give to you that it is perpendicular, so in other words, in this case over here, I'm telling you that it is perpendicular, then you will use reason number one. If, however, I tell you that the two lines are equal or that they are bisected, like this line over here, then you know that you're going to use the converse of that theorem. So let's go ahead and answer the question. Whenever we're dealing with Euclidean geometry, our goal straight out of the blocks when we start is to read and analyze the question properly, to create that geometric understanding. So we start off by reading, O is the center of the circle. The moment you read that word, center, you want to apply every single center theorem that you have. So up until this point, you know that the line from center is perpendicular to the chord or the line from center bisects chord. Those are the theorems that you know. But going forward, you'll see that there's actually quite a few theorems that involve the center of the circle. So if I give you a key word like that, you can think of maybe three or four different theorems that could apply. Obviously, in this question, we're not going to have to worry about that because we haven't dealt with those theorems in class yet. But it's about getting that reasoning from the beginning. Then it goes on to say that OE is parallel to AB. So OE over here is parallel to AB or perpendicular, sorry, to AB. If they are perpendicular, we know that we can use theorem number one or the actual theorem, not the converse. It also goes on to say that EB is 7 units, so EB is 7 units, and that OE is 24 units. And it also says that DF equals FC, so in other words, that chord is bisected, so this is basically telling us that the chord is bisected. And then it says determine with reasons the length of FO. So I want this over here. Now, whenever we're dealing with theorems in circles, the center of the circle is probably one of the most important bits of information I give you. Because it not only allows us to use a variety of different theorems, but it also tells us where we have radii. So do you see there and there, we have a radius, and there as well. Now, because we know properties of a circle, we know that all those lines are equal. So keep that in mind. It might help us going forward. So we want the length of FO. In order to get that, do you see how I know that that side FC is 15? And so DF is also 15. 
But that's pretty much all I have in this triangle over here. That's all the information I have. I have nothing else to find OF. If, however, I can get the length of the radius, well, then I know that I can find that OF side using Pythagoras. But before I can do that, I would firstly have to have a right angle triangle. So that's my thought process going forward. How I want to link this up is use this part of the circle over here to figure out the length of the radius. Then I want to go back into using this part over here to find the line OF. So let's begin and watch the way I set this out so that you don't make silly mistakes. I would start off by saying I want to deal with this triangle over here first off. So in order to deal with that triangle, I know that this line over here is 7 units long. But I can't make a statement without backing it up. So in order to back it up that AE is 7 units as well, I would say that AE is equal to EB. And the reason I know that is I've got a line from center which is perpendicular. I'm being told it's perpendicular, so I use this reason over here. So my reason would be line from center perpendicular to chord. Then I can say therefore AE is equal to 7 units. Okay. Now I can go ahead and do Pythagoras in that triangle so that I can figure out the length of AO, which is a radius. So I can say that AO is equal to 24 squared plus 7 squared. And that is going to give us, and that gives us 25 units. So I know that this line AO is 25, but it's also a radius. So that means that in this triangle over here, the line DO should be 25 units. Again though, I can't write that without backing it up. So I would say DO is equal to AO, which is 25 units, and the reason for that is radii. Now I can go over and move into the green triangle. Problem is, I don't have it as a right angle triangle. So I need to make that statement first. I'm given that this chord is bisected. So I know that line is perpendicular. And so I can go and say that angle F is 90 degrees. And the reason is line from center I'm told the chord is bisected. That's what the question gives me. So I write line from center bisects chord. Do you see the difference now? Where I write from perpendicular or bisects depending on what I'm given in the question. So if I'm given that it's perpendicular, I write perpendicular in my reason. If I'm given that it's bisected, I write bisected in my reason. Now that I know that angle is 90 degrees, I can write Pythag. Don't forget to write your reason Pythag as well. I nearly forgot there. And so in the next triangle, I can write that OF is going to be equal to 25 squared minus 15 squared. Again, my reason is Pythag. Don't forget that. You don't want to lose easy marks. So therefore, the line OF is going to be equal to, it's going to be equal to 20 units. So guys, this is an example of how we would apply theorem 1 in an exam type question. I hope you have a little bit more understanding of the few questions we've dealt with in this video and that you have confidence moving into the rest of your studying. All the best.